created and uh, extend a heartfelt welcome to those who are listening to the stream or watching the stream at home. Also to those who are in the Caribbean region and to the globe, welcome. Um, first, I want to apologize for last Sabbath in that enough time was not given for ventilation. Um, this Sabbath, I want to take you down a particular path and ask some questions. Now, just before we pray to begin, um, I know that some of us are kind of hesitant to get up and voluntarily make your points, which I prefer, rather than having to ask persons to respond to questions and so on. But I want you to bear this in mind. In the final crisis, we are told by Ellen White that the most intelligent men those who are considered geniuses will scrutinize every aspect of our faith and we will be called to account. So consider now an opportunity to voluntarily come forward and make your points and respond to the questions. So therefore, before we go any further, let us pray to begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for Jesus because of his redemptive work. We are alive and in your house of worship today. As we look into the theme of redemption and the path that you travel, we are told that the science of redemption, it will be our intellectual pursuit in eternity and it will produce emotional responses of love as the redeemed delve into the plan of redemption. And we so now pray that your Holy Spirit will enlighten our understanding, dear Lord, I must admit the frailty of language and the ability to communicate, so I ask that you would give me an unction of your spirit to take us down a path to conclusions that are beyond belief. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. The first thing I want to make is that is this, if God was not willing to take a risk and a fearful risk in sending his son to redeem humanity, then the declaration God is not love comes under question. And that may seem like a controversial statement. Now the issue of risk and failure comes from the inspired pen of the spirit of prophecy. And so it is in that context I want to take you down a particular path and ask questions and come to conclusions. Now last week, in response to the question of what comparatively is there of risk taken by God in relation to risk taken by human beings, by us. Now four points came out. 
The first point is that because God is love, he made creatures free with the possibility of choosing a different outcome than he intended. That's one point that was made. The other point is that with that freedom existed the risk of losing the human race by their wrong choice. That's another point that was made. And God himself, in the pursuit of redeeming man, opened himself up to failure and eternal loss. That is one of the points that was made also. And the fourth point that was made is that God took a calculated risk. Now, how, do, how, do, how does one define a calculated risk? It is on this point I will lay a foundation by definition, take us down a particular path and ask questions. Now, the definition of a calculated risk can be it is an action done with full awareness of the likely consequences. The risk is planned with forethought beforehand. And the risk is worth taking because the outcome is anticipated success. Now, some of us as human beings go reckless into a particular course of action based on a plan. But this definition says that quite a considerable amount of forethought is given to a plan and all the risks involved in that plan so far as one can see. Now, humanly speaking, let's go back into eternity. And what do we see? God foresaw that if he made man, there was a possibility of failure. And what did God do? I read for you. What Anna White says in Desire of Ages 8, 3, 4. Before the foundations of the earth were laid, the Father and Son had united in a covenant to redeem man if he should be overcome by Satan. They clasped their hands in a solemn pledge that Christ would become the surety of the human race. No, that's in eternity. Now, what was the nature of that covenant? She continues, and I quote. She says that in every step of the plan, in perfect detail, the Son of God saw. So everything that he did on earth, he foresaw from all eternity. Are you following me so far? No. Any plan has risks and it can involve failure. I remember when I first became a Southern Adventist, Honestly, I thought everybody were saints. And no, I, I believe that when I first became a self Adventist and I entered into a business, a business arrangement with a brother who seemed to be a saint and it turned out otherwise. And this business arrangement was to build a house it wasn't for me, it was for my mother. And my, my mother has gone to her grave without a house and without the money that was invested. And that was a brother. 
So there are risks involved in anything that you do. Risk involved in anything that you do. So now, let us move from eternity to time. When the Son of God will now enter into the fulfillment of the plan. And the way it says in Desire of Ages 147, but as he walked among men, he was guided step by step by the Father's will. Now, this is the question I want to ask. And the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through to 8, mentioned three prerequisites, listen carefully, for the fulfillment of of the plan. So turn, turn to Philippians chapter 2. And I want three persons to give me the three prerequisites. Not now in eternity, but in time when the plan was to be put into effect. Philippians chapter 2, verses 2, verses 5 through 8, rather. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through to 8. Three persons to just briefly, concisely, as you look at the, what Paul says, of the three prerequisites that the Son of God, when becoming out the Son of Man, had to qualify to be and to fulfill the plan. What's the first thing that Paul mentions in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8? What are the three prerequisites? Now, I, I don't want to call names, but if I have to, because you'll be called upon in the final crisis. I prefer voluntary responses. What about verse 7? It says that Jesus became of no reputation. Now that word, reputation, is an awkward word in the King James translation. It is from the Greek word kenosis. It simply means to empty something of its contents. What did Jesus empty himself of in the Incarnation? Jesus and his native deity before the incarnation. Now, he became a human being. What did he empty himself of in the incarnation? Or any other of those prerequisites you can state. Any thoughts? Well, I'm going to have to start to call names. You don't have to answer that first one, but there are three prerequisites here. This is time for discussion. Sister Judy Dash. Yeah, good morning, all. Good morning. Right, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, when we become Christians, as a matter of fact, let's go a bit further. When our four parents sing, that's Adam and Eve, they lost the perfect mind that Christ had given to them, the mind of his righteousness, and by listening to Satan, they took Satan's mind. And that is the way how he thinks. And then it says, he, as we said, he made himself of no reputation. It means that he humbly emptied himself, laid aside the divine nature, and took upon himself our sinful, fallen nature. Okay, thank you, Sister Judy. Dash. So, 
He emptied himself of his divine prerogatives, which are the three omnis, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. Because he now became what? A human being. That is one of the other prerequisites. And what is the third? Verse 8 tells you what is the third prerequisite. Anybody? Seeing that the congregation is slow off the mark this morning. All right. He was subject to death. Those are the three prerequisites in order to fulfill the plan. Now, next question. What is it in our humanity that gives us trouble that when Jesus took on our humanity, gave him trouble? Pardon? Sister Angela, you can go to the mic and state the, your point. And additionally, while you're at the mic, you can, what is the process or what is it that particularly that gives us trouble, that gave him trouble, and uh, what a particular Bible writer states explicitly what gives us trouble that gave him trouble? What gave him trouble that gives us trouble is our sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. And the Bible writer that wrote that he was tempted in all points like as we are. Correct. Yeah, without sin. Okay. How would you define temptation now? Being drawn away with your own lust and entice. Something oh. that draws on you. Mm-hmm. And entices with a sin. Is the enticement sin? No. Temptation is not sin. Okay. It's yielding to that temptation that is sin. And where does the yielding first begin? In the mind. In the mind. Are we clear there? Temptation originates in the mind when we give in to the sinful thought. That's why you can sin in your mind and not outwardly. And nobody Correct. can see it, but as far as God is concerned, you'll sin. Okay, good. Thank you, Sister Carmita. Okay, I, I would like if you can revisit verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. But you're saying that the third point is subject to death. But yes. we, we are all subject to death. Is it really subject to death, or is it the humility and the obedience? Well, that is the character content of his, humi of his condescension. And by the way, listen carefully. Jesus came down to show us what up looks like. You ever thought about that? Jesus came down to show us what up looks like. And when he showed the human race what up looks like, they crucified him. But he ascended back up and is enthroned. Now Babylon always seeks ascension. But eventually Babylon, if you check the Bible, always falls. That's for another thing. So, good point, Sister Carmita. Um, that was the character orientation of his coming down. But because he was a human being, he was subject to death. He could not retain his divine prerogatives. Or, to put it better, he could not use his divine prerogatives and be subject to death. He gave up the independent use of them and he became subject to the Father's will in fulfilling the plan. But now as a human being, because he emptied himself of those divine prerogatives, he could not see the plan before him. 
At every step, the father showed him, and he had to either yield or not yield. Is that not so? He was a free moral agent. Okay. So was Jesus tempted with the same severity as us as human beings, and even beyond? Beyond. And I'll read two statements. This is taken from Christ tri Triumphant. This is the devotional book. As God, he could not be tempted, but as a man, he, he could be tempted, and that strongly, and could yield, listen carefully, and could yield to the temptations. His human nature must pass through the same test and trial that Adam and Eve pass through. Another quotation. The Son of God in his humanity wrestled with the very same fierce, apparently overwhelming temptations that assail men. Temptations to indulge to the indulgence of appetite. The presumptuous venturing where God has not led them and to the worship of the God of this world to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. Now, Jesus was born to a battlefield. And at every step or in the fulfillment of the plan, he had an adversary. And this adversary, the serpent, attempted to bruise the head of the seed. And listen to his tactics. He engaged in what we can call guerrilla warfare. In other words, no hold bar. However you can get the enemy, however you can overthrow the enemy, you pursue with it in a relentless mode. So Jesus was born to a battlefield. And this quotation is taken from Desire of Ages 7.3.4. And this is when Jesus was before Annas and Caiaphas. Jesus was tried three times illegally according to Jewish law at night. Any trial, any trial had to be in the day according to Jewish law. And he was tried three times by Roman tribunals. Six times, six, the symbol of man. Listen carefully now. Satan, led by the cruel mob in its abuse of the Savior, it was his purpose to provoke him to retaliation, if possible, or to drive him to perform a miracle, not this language, to save himself. And thus, notice the the logical progression of the conclusions Ellen White is coming to, and thus break up the plan of salvation. One stain upon his human life, one failure of his humanity to endure the terrible test, and the Lamb of God would have been an imperfect offering and the redemption of man a failure. Question. Would giving in to provocation bring a stain on his character? Anybody? Would provocation bring a stain on his character if he's given in to provocation? Yes, I'm going to answer that one. Yes, of course. Next question now. Would using his divine power to work a miracle would also bring a stain on his character. And if so, if you're saying yes, you have to come to the mic and give an explanation. Because if you're, if you're saying yes, you must have a premise for saying yes. Now, it is clear that giving into provocation is sin. But using his divine power to escape peril or danger, or going contrary to the plan, 
Will that also bring a stand on his character? I hear a lot of responses. Um, Brother Peter, white. I would say yes, because it will lead us not to trust in God, but to trust in, in our own strength. All right, trusting in your own strength. Okay, good thought. Any other thoughts? Brother David Jones, any thoughts? Would Jesus, in using his divine power to escape danger, work in a miracle, bring a stand on his character? Good morning. Good morning. I would say yes because he will be using something that we don't have, and that is divinity. Yes, he'll be using something that we don't have, but would that bring a stand on his character using his divinity since he had relinquished the independent use of it and now he had been dependent on his father following the plan that was perfect in all details from all eternity, but now he had to depend on the father showing him step by step the plan and irrespective of how compelling the temptation was to go contrary to the plan, even using his divinity, in using that divinity, will that be a stain on his character? I would say yes. Okay. All right, any other thought on that? Do you want to pursue it any further? Because... Um he would be disobeying or the, the, the plan that was already there. He would have gone contrary. All right. He would have gone contrary to the plan. Yes. Okay. Now, what biblically is the meaning of saving himself? I'll give you a hint. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Love seeketh not its own. What does that mean? We read it, read it many times in the Bible. What does that mean? Love seeketh not its own. What does that mean? In relation to work in a miracle to save himself. Brother Peter, you can come to the mic. Um, that is actually um, awareness. Not seeking his own means, seeking his own means, his own means and he is not fully trusting in the Father to guide him in the path of righteousness. Okay, seeking his own way. Everybody agree with that? Self seeking is the basic orientation of self seeking is self interest, seeking your own way. And who originated the principle of self-seeking? Satan. And the way it says, sin originated in self-seeking. These are verses, page 21. Everybody agree with that? That sin originated in self-seeking? And that if Jesus had used his divine power to work a miracle, would not he be working in his own interest and not the interest of others since the basic orientation of love is that it seeketh not its own, it is other-centered and not what? Self-centered. It does not seek its own interest. To go to the plan is contrary to the principle of the basic orientation of love. Brother Andrew Jordan. Morning. Morning. Um, when Christ came, he 
ain't come, as you say, he ain't come to do nothing of his own. Everything he did is of the Father. Whatever the Father tell him to do, even perform miracles, and he never did nothing of his own. So everything that he did was what the Father wanted him to do. Now, I want to go back a little bit. We said that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world, even before the foundation of the world. That means even before angels was created, even before Lucifer was created, the Father could have seen the Son coming and dying for mankind. Agree? Yes. Now, we say we should not put foreknowledge into play. Well, you can put foreknowledge, no okay, problem. Well, okay, then. Go ahead. Now, well, I will put foreknowledge because mm -hmm. the Father could have seen, and if you read the statement properly, the statement didn't have nothing to do with the Son per se. Which statement? That the Father took a fearful risk in sending the Son. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Son the didn't son take a fearful risk either? No, no, no. It, it, it never said the Son. It said okay. the Father. Okay. So, when the Son came, the Son didn't know the next step. Correct. Every step he take, he depends on the Father for mm -hmm. instructions. Mm -hmm. Got me clear? Now, to say that the Father take a risk and send the Son, that word risk, we cannot put that risk pretend to God, just like we cannot put God destroying or God sending strong delusions or a hardened fear of heart, then statement. We cannot use the word risk. How we understand risk? I could go down the road, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure if I come back, I could get knocked on by a car. Mm -hmm. That's a risk going across the road. Okay. We ain't sure. But when we put the word risk and say the father taking it, and as Carmita said last week, I calculate the risk. How could somebody that can see the choice that you can make ensure if the choice that you make can be the choice that he, that he could see? And God is omniscient. He, can, he knows the choice you're going to make. He also know the choice that Christ had to make and did make at the cross. Even though he had to face all the pressures of the world that was coming up on him. So, as I said, the statement did not say the son take a fearful risk. Because the son didn't know the outcome. Suppose I share statements with you where it says the son, the father took a fear, the son took a fearful risk. <laughs> he didn't know. So oh. I could agree with that statement, but oh, the statement okay. you are talking about says the father. Okay. So, so if you see statements that says the son took a fearful risk, the I son took a fearful risk. That. Right, Brother Andrew? I could, I, I could say that, but not the father. But not the father. Not the father didn't take a fearful risk. No, he didn't. Or his sister. So he could have seen <laughs> the choice that the son okay. could have made. Okay. Thank you, Brother Andrew, Sister Karamita. Brother Andrew, you, you have a, a, a big problem. Now, because you can see something, it doesn't mean that you're predestinating that. And that is where you're coming from. Because the Father could have seen that, that doesn't mean that because he can see it, he's making it happen. And therefore, you have to be careful. The Father can see it, yes. But it's still a risk because the person could decide yes or they decide no. Christ could have decided, let me let this pass me and let me not do it anymore. Even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, you know, I'm sure he was still struggling as he was praying to the Father. So what I am gathering from you, not only now, but when we had that little conversation in the corner there last week, you are seeing because some person knows something, they're making it happen. And you got to make, you got to be clear that because the father knows something, he is not predestinating it. You might not want to use that word, but your thinking is going there. And you have to be careful of that. Thank you, Sister Karamita. Now, all right, Brother Andrew, you, you come to the mic. When, if you say that God foresaw what he did, every step of the way, and he saw that the outcome would be success, 
And therefore, because of his foreknowledge, there was no risk. You have entered into the realm of Calvinistic theology, where it says that God, doesn't matter what you say, God is all power and control, and somehow God micromanaged, manipulated either the plan in total or in part. So be very careful in muddling the theological waters between Calvinism or deterministic theism, it is called that, or benevolent theism, that God is good, and if God is good and he's love, there is love, freedom, and risk. That is inescapable in that formula. Love, freedom, and risk. Where there is love, there must be freedom, and where freedom is, there is risk. Brother Andrew. First thing, uh, when we say that God is omniscient, what do we really mean? Explain to me. He's all-knowing. He's all-knowing. Good. Does God know the choice you can make next week at a particular time, particular minute? Of course. Right. So what I'm saying, Camilla, I'm not saying that God predestined Christ not to sin. All I am saying is God the Father saw the choice that Christ would have made every step of the way. Every step of the way. So therefore, it ain't that like God saying, well, don't do that. And, and, and as, as, you said, as you said before, Christ come to do every single thing the Father sent him to do. And to stray from it will be sin. Another question as I asked you last week. Can a person that is in Christ sin? All right, we got off the path there. No, no, right? I, let us, the, let the, us no, stay on the path, but this all right? Is the path. The, let us stay on the path for the time being. Okay, Sister oh. Angela Leeko. I have a question. Um, the point you made, that's when you said love, um, freedom, freedom risk. risk, okay? And But Andrew must remember, God did not, the Lord did not, Christ did not come down here as we would say like a wind-up toy, where you had to go a certain path. I get the impression that you are saying that because they made a plan, Christ had to follow that plan. So what are you saying then? If he didn't have to follow no. the plan, you see, you're not saying that. He didn't have to follow the plan. Therefore, he had a choice whether to follow it or not. So, therefore, he had a choice whether to sin or not. Okay? Now, okay. so you are saying to, I know the, the statement that says God sits above the earth in calmness. In calm. He can see the end from the beginning. Does, my question to you, Brother Lassels. Does this mean when it says that God sits in calm above because he knows everything that will happen, who will be saved, who will be lost, and at the end his name will be vindicated? Is he calm because he knows this and therefore he has no anxiety as, as in, in quotations? We, we, can, we were going to get to that. Okay, thank you. We were going to get to that. Brother Elder Solico. We have about 10 minutes, but this question, this issue, is, is, it is of magnitude proportions when we come to certain conclusions. Before I got married, my wife chose to say yes to me, and we got married. If someone foresaw that she would have chosen to serve me, to, 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 to choose me, does it mean that she had no other suitors or any other choices? We know that she had other choices and suitors, but she chose me. Does that preclude that she had to choose me? Of and course not. She, she had no other suitors to give in to, that she didn't have to choose me? That's the line of your reasoning. That because Christ didn't sin, he could not have sinned. 
and that he chose not to sin because his father had him not to sin. What does the line you follow in there? You're looking at the outcome as the basis for the fact that there's no that he had no choice or that he could, have, could not have chosen other ways because of the outcome. But as I said already, God's foreknowledge of outcomes does not interfere with creatures' freedom of choice, which is a real possibility that they could, have de they could deviate from God's plan. A man could have deviated from God's plan, Christ could have deviated from God's plan and produced a different outcome and result. Yeah? Is that possible? So, he chose not to do it. The inspiration tells us he could have failed, but he did not fail. Christ did not fail, neither was he discouraged, and his disciples are to have a faith of the same enduring might. Now we have to understand that Christ overcame just as Christ overcame, we are to overcome. So we can over Christ, overcome as Christ overcame. Or we can choose not to overcome and let the plan of redemption fail on our part in terms of God saving humanity. So if God had lost out on the plan of salvation, he would have lost humanity and was that a real possibility as far as God in heaven is concerned? I said, was that a real possibility as far as God the Father is concerned in losing out on humanity? I ask the question. If it is right. true, it means the Father could have lost humanity which he had created in his own image. All right, thank you. But, but as you, before you go to answer, um, Sister... I can't remember... Getting old, I can't remember the sister name now, sorry. Rhea. Yes. Okay, from my understanding, Brother Andrew is not saying that. From my understanding, his problem is with the word risk. I didn't think we need to find the definition of the word risk for Brother Andrew because I think from what he is saying that he agrees that Christ could have chosen either way. But I think his problem is that he believes that a risk comes when, when there's no for, for knowledge. So he's saying that as long as I can foresee the outcome, there's no risk. Not that there are not, no possibilities. For, I, as far as I understand it, there was a risk as long as there is a choice that it can go either way. Correct. Right? So as long as there's a choice that it could go either way, there's a risk. But for Andrew... Although there is a choice that can go either way, as long as you see which way it will go, there is no risk. And that's what he is. I think that's his main problem. He's not saying that there's no choice. He's not saying that uh, Christ couldn't have chosen or he didn't have to submit. He's saying that. But his problem is that definition. So we have to define that word risk for him mm -hmm. so we all are on the same playing field. Okay, thank you. Let's flesh that out then. Let's, let's, let me look at a quotation it deserves ages of 100. This was when he was before Anas and Caiaphas and he was being abused, being tried unjustly. She says, Christ suffered keenly under abuse and insult. His trial by men who acted as fiends was to him a perpetual sacrifice. To be surrounded by human beings under the control of Satan was revolting to him. Listen now. And he knew that in a moment, by the flashing forth of his divine power, he could lay his cruel tormentors in the dust. This is under severe pressure. He knew that. And he was, was he not tempted to do so? Look, look at the language of Eloi. He could lay his cruel tormentors under dust, and he could have doomed his enemies to death. He who could have doomed his enemies to death bore with their cruelty. The sensitivity of the humanity of Christ was of such that it was detestable to him that he had to bear 
and endure cruelty and insult to the point where the thought came to his mind and not only the thought, the temptation to wipe out all of his adversaries before him. Is that not so? Based on this quotation. And therefore, would that not be a stain on his character? So, and away equates risk and failure with temptation. And temptation can go in a positive way or in a negative way. And there are many times, for example, in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, let me read the statement. These are verses 690. The humanity of the Son of God trembled in that trying hour. He prayed not now for his disciples that their feet might not fail, but for his own tempted, agonized soul, the awful moment had come. Now, the Father and the Son had covenanted and saw that, that Gethsemane moment in eternity, right? But in time now, in time, under the anguish of taking the collective sins of the world on himself and in consequence facing or experiencing the separation because of that collective guilt. And the says that or the destiny of the world hang in balance. What does that mean? Hang in the balance? It could go either way. And when Jesus said, if it be possible, Father, let this cup, which is a Hebrew idiom to mean experience, and it was a woeful experience past me. What was Jesus thinking? What was he saying by that? Father, if there was another way. So at the point in time, when Jesus was experiencing what he foresaw, he was tempted to choose another way. And therefore, that is the element of risk and failure right there. Okay. Any other thoughts? Adelika, we'll close on this point and continue from there next week. And I'll read one statement for you from the pen of Ellen White. The, the human understanding of risk, which has to do with a situation involving exposure to danger on the part of God. There is the definition of risk that involves a situation where uh, a person is exposed to harm or loss. Was God exposed to harm or loss? Yes. Can God feel pain? Can he hurt? Yes. Um, another definition of risk is the possibility of something bad happening. You know, every time I define this and explain, I don't see Andrew wrong at all. Anyhow, was there the possibility of something bad happening to God's creation? Yes. Could the creation go differently to what God intended? Yes. All of that is what we're talking about. God could have lost humanity. Uh, humanity made a bad choice and produced some bad results. And all of that risk is a chance or probability that a person will be harmed or experience an adverse effect. And if we go down the line, losing property, losing equipment, harmful effects, and so on. And that is what we are talking about. We are not talking about the security of God. We are not talking about the uncertainty of God. We are talking about what God could have lost, which was a real possibility. Amen. I'll read two statements to close. Who can estimate the value of a soul? And the white says, go to Gethsemane, and they watch with Jesus through those long hours of anguish when he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior on the uplifted cross. Hear the despairing cry. 
my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet. Remember Christ rest all. These are not my words. The words of risk and eternal loss and failure. Even Ella White says that just as how a father trembles to expose his son to life, so it was with the father. Was, was those just poetic words that the father trembled? It was those just poetic, po poetic words or God didn't have the sensibility, sensitivity of throwing his son into or allowing his son to go into the, to the battlefield. She continues. Remember, Christ rests all. Tempted like as we are, he stake his own eternal existence upon the issue of the conflict. You understand what, what, what those words mean? <laughs> he stake his own eternal existence. I will not the Father being affected by that loss of eternal existence. Do you understand what those terms mean? We're going to look into that next week. Heaven itself was in peril for our redemption. Could the Father escape that? She says heaven itself at the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Jesus would have yielded up his life. And in that, we could estimate the value of a soul. Now, this quotation and other quotations, which I wish here, says that God could not live without us. I repeat that again. That God could not live without us. That God preferred our existence in favor of his. And this is the magnitude of the risk and failure in pursuing us to save us. Now, if we say that God didn't really take a risk, what are we really doing? We are saying the outcome was absolutely sure. There was no possibility of failure. And that uh, it was a foregone conclusion. God didn't really tremble. There was no pain of separation. All of that we are saying that God's love is of such enormity that he valued our life above his own. And that is the love of God. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are lost for words at the enormity of your love for sinners. We thank you that we can experience and enter into that love, but we cannot with human minds comprehend the bravity, the enormity, the astoundedness of your love for sinners. May such a thought that you could not live without us and therefore you sent your son to redeem us at the risk of failure and eternal loss, not only to the son, but to yourself. May this thought move our hearts in complete surrender and consecration to you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. God bless you as you continue to worship. We take 10 minutes for a break before we resume with the ministry of the word and the divine hour message. Thank you.